Welcome to the Cross Border Interviews, where we sit down with local elected leaders from all across Canada. Throughout this episode, we will be learning about who our guest is, what drives them, and how they are working to make their community a better place for everyone. Now, in today's episode, we are honored to be sitting down with Kenora Councillor Kelsey Van Bellingham. But before we get into today's interview, a brief moment to remind everyone of our newest show, The Political Trenches, Local Government at Work, where we dive, along with Ian McCormick, into the biggest news stories municipally from across Canada, and we dissect them from a political standpoint. Search Political Trenches, Local Government at Work on Spotify or Apple Podcast, or by visiting Cross Border Interviews' YouTube channel and watch the latest episode now. Now, on to our interview. Kelsey, I want to thank you so much for doing this. Greatly appreciate it. I want to start with a question that is a general question, but is a question I ask every single person who's ever come on the show. And as I know you have listened to my show, you are aware (laughs) that this question is coming. So for you, where did your sense of duty to serve come from? So I've been thinking about this one because I do listen to the podcast. (laughs) Um, And it's sort of been an evolution of a few things in my life, Um, a sort of a general sense of re-educating myself and growing. And it really started when I was in um, college and I had a roommate who was just really in tune and really smart and really sort of helped me realize a lot of things around my own privilege. And then when I moved to Kenora, Ontario, I started work as a financial advisor for our credit union. And in that role, you know, it's imperative to not have all of your eggs in one basket. And that's sort of one of the key risk mitigation strategies to making sure that, you know, everything always has risk associated with it. And so we want to make sure you balance off that risk with different um, asset classes. And, And so that awareness of that being such an important financial strategy, and yet we're always missing that for the most part at those decision-making tables was something where sort of this confluence of I am a person who does have privilege and ability to do this role because you you need to have an immense amount of privilege to be a counselor. It is extremely underpaid. It's a huge time commitment and people in their income earning years, it's very difficult for them to be like, Hey, yeah, let me take four years of, you know, potentially impacting my income to serve my community. But I also so strongly believe that it's important to have different voices at the table because if everyone at the table is coming from sort of a similar lived experience, you're going to just miss things because we all only know what we know. And it's important to have those other voices at the table to be like, hey, did you think of it this way? Or this is my perspective. And um, something that's actually really cool about our council is we're almost all new. The mayor was on council prior. Um, I know Lindsay spoke about this. And, but the great thing about the way that a split is we have a, we have four women, three men on our council and we have, including the mayor. And then we actually have a gender split of, or sorry, an age split where three of us are under 40 and then four of us are over. So that really brings a very diverse um, and a lot of unique perspectives. And it's been interesting because we're all sort of like learning and growing together, but I actually think it's been really great from a democratic position because there's things that I've come into meetings and like I sort of had an idea of where I was going with it and then you sit at that table and you listen to those other perspectives and I've changed my mind during meetings before so I actually think it's really that's sort of where it all came from those sort of two things of privilege and and the risk mitigation strategy was really where it came to with for me. You have listened to my show. I could tell from that answer. You've answered like nine questions in that one answer. Um, I, I, I do want to just be up front because I, I am cautious uh, that uh, you are just getting over a cold right now. So uh, yes. your vi- voice might be going. I, I did hear a little bit crack there. So I just want to let everyone know that... I, so I it's will not the be, regular exactly so just in case everyone's going oh why is it, why does it sound like she's getting quieter no it's just because she's getting over a cold right now um yes, I want to talk about your upbringing a little bit because you you started your story your answer sort of in college but mm-hmm. I want to know was mom and dad political growing up did you get involved pol- politically with them or were you guys the dinner table that didn't really talk about politics growing up Absolutely not. And I like my parents are incredible people. My mom is like 
truly my hero. She's a wonderful human being. She, her ability to stick her head in the sand about what is going on in the world is like a superpower. She knows zero and she lives wonderfully. And she, so no, like not at all. It was definitely something that I came to over time. Actually, a lot of my political awakenings, I would say, came through different podcasts that I listened to. Um sort of like comedy, but but a lot of, of um, political sort of spectrums tied into it. And I like to, that's, I mean, I'm a, I'm a millennial, so that's how I get my news too, is through podcasts. But it probably, I probably started getting more active in it in my mid-20s. I don't think I voted until I lived in Oakville, which would have been when I was 24 for the first time. Um, and it's, and it's been growing since then. So no, not at all. I mean, I would say even on my dad's side, we sort of have like a, a waspy sort of, you know, like you don't talk about politics at the dinner table kind of thing. So it was not something I grew up with. No. Okay. So you, you've just mentioned a community that I know quite well, mm -hmm. and that is Oakville. And yes. I, I, I'm doing basic math here for geography and basic geography here, but Oakville to Kenora is not a hop, skip, and jump. It's like a hop, skip, jump, and five-hour drive to the place where you need to get to a plane to get to Kenora. How did you How did you find yourself in Kenora? You talk about the financial advisor aspect of it, but yeah. um, was Kenora on the radar, or was it just you moved there and you fell in love with the community, so you stayed? Because you could have left, but you decided to stay and then run for council in 2022. Yes. Yeah, so I actually was born and raised in Kimberly, BC. My parents are both from Winnipeg, Manitoba, though. I know we're, we're going to take a lot of left turns here in this story, but my parents are both from Winnipeg. So we've always been seasonal residents of Lake of the Woods. My grandparents always had a place in Clearwater Bay and my nanny and papa in Sioux Narrows. So I've spent summers here my whole life. I went to, I lived in Winnipeg for a few years and then I went to Oakville and I lived in Toronto, but during some of my like growing and like education and, um, careers and then I had moved back or I was just planning on spending a summer with my grandparents it was 2017 and I actually fell in love with a local while I was Aww. here and then I know and then that was sort of how I made this a permanent part of my life so it was not intentional to be here permanently and then I was like well I'm here and we are raising our kids here and I want to make sure this is a sustainable community so, so what was happening for council <laughs> and that's where I want to pick up this part of the story so in 2022 you ultimately decide this was the election that I was going to put my name forward in uh, mm -hmm. you could have done it in 2018 but you had just been there for a year so there might have yeah. been a, a circumstances that you decided against that but in 2022 you decided to make the leap what was that decision based on ultimately? Was it just you wanted to have that different perspective around the council table or was there an other underlying circumstance that you said, I need to be at that table to have my voice heard and what's going on in the community? I think I can address it better than potentially somebody else. So I wish I could tell you I'm a very organized person and I've had a huge plan behind this. <laughs> but the fact of the matter, I am who I am. And I'm um, actually my husband had done the city puts on a webinar to sort of give community members an idea of what it is to be a counselor. And my husband was doing the webinar and I had I, our son had been born. So I think he was maybe like four or five months at a time and my daughter would have just been I don't know like a year and a half or so so I was like cooking dinner or something or like we were at the dinner table and he was listening to this thing and I was like you don't have time to do this like I don't know why you even signed up for this and that was sort of the thing though that ticked in my brain of like I know how important it is the diversity piece the and then having that privilege piece of me of being able to say like I do have the time and ability to do this right now was really what it was so it was actually in 2022 that I made the decision to do it and um yeah it was not super well thought out I learned so much during the campaign and I will say like I am so grateful for like politics now and so many of my you, you know municipal buds that I've like made across the province because I was able to learn so much through the campaign process and then afterwards from them um that I think really helped now me get to this position 
you could have chosen any different level of government, but at the end of the day, you chose municipally because in 2022, there is two elections that are happening in the province of Ontario, one provincially and one municipally. You, though, I know you say you're not organized, but you make the organized decision to run municipally. Was there a factor about the municipal or there was there a desire about the municipal government that you said, I want to impact my community locally. I don't want to go off to Queens Park. I want to stay in my community and make it better than going off to Ottawa or going off to Toronto to do my job. I want to stay here locally and impact my residents and help my residents locally. So I think for me, the biggest part is with party politics, there's already there's always so much that you sort of have to adhere to within the party, um, which can be a challenge. And, and there's also lots of strengths behind behind that, too, because you do sort of get there's a huge machine with it and there's um, all of the resources associated with that. But at the municipal level, you really get to have the opportunity to explain how you are coming to your decision from your own perspective which is I think really unique and um, really important from a democracy standpoint is that uh, like I don't find at this level you're you're not really playing politics as much or or so much of the game part of it it's really like we're making these decisions and this is how we're coming to this decision and I know for myself whenever I'm showing up and making a decision that my only goal and the only promise I made during out my campaign was how I would make decisions. I never promised anything to anyone throughout because I think that's asinine because you have six other people who are going to make decisions as well. But I want to make sure that I'm making good informed decisions. And so I have the opportunity at the municipal level to do that for myself because I don't have any sort of preconceived anything that I need to come to it with. You are relatively just over a year, if you're listening to this as it airs, or if you're listening to this later on, we're recording this almost one year after you were elected as a city councillor for the city of Kenora. And before I ask about the issues and talk about the city as itself, I want to get the perspective of you, sort of a newcomer to politics, a newcomer to elected office. Was it what you expected? When you put your name on that ballot in 2022, you probably had a a notion of what the municipal government and politics was all about. But being behind that table is a different entity. It's a different beast in itself. For you, what was the biggest eye-opening experience over the last year? And what was the thing that you said, oh, I didn't expect it to be this? So yes and no. Like the workload was for the most part what I expected. I am a little bit of a I don't know a type a as far as I'm going to if I'm going to do a job I'm going to do it well so I had I think an expectation around the workload the relationship piece I don't think I really focused on as much because it's also hard when you're in an election you don't know who's going to end up at that table and um at the end of the day all of the counselors and then staff that's your colleagues but you're coming into it and all of us are new and you know forming relationships and and trying to figure out how we work together that's and 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 I don't mean challenge in that it's bad by any means it's just that it's it's that's the heavy lifting that I didn't really see having so much (laughs) take so much and be so heavy I guess um, it's all, and I, I just like, we have a great group of people at the table. Um, and, and I think a year into it, we're definitely working through that a bit more, but, but that, that there was, there's growing pains in new relationships as, as with anything. Right. And I agree with that. Um, but the role of the counselor is quite mm-hmm. different because you have to sort of make sure that everyone, even those who didn't vote for you, and I, I looked, you did not get 100% of the votes cast. I, I, I'm going <laughs> to say that every single time because people may assume that they might, unless you're acclaimed, people voted against you. People said, maybe you're not yep. the right person for the job. How do you see your role and how do you see the role as counselor in ensuring that you're not just talking to the people that have voted for you, but also for the people who may have not have even voted or voted against you and say, okay, you may not have voted for me, but I'm still your representative. I'm still at the council table. 
And I want to make sure that all issues are addressed, not just the people who voted for me or are in my echo chamber of social media. Yeah. So I just want to take one second and just give a little credit to the city of Kenora because we were actually the highest electoral turnout in the province at over 50%, which is incredible for municipal elections, even higher than like the provincial average. So no, I didn't get, I, I don't know, I was somewhere in the middle of the pack, I think for, for who voted um, for us. And so I think that goes back to the fact, so what I try and do is I try and disseminate the information through my social media in a way that's easily digestible. I'm trying to I always, you know, leave the caveat of obviously I'm a human being, I have biases. So this is always going to be my lens on things. Please, you know, we have live recordings and um, the minutes and agenda are always online. And then I try and ask, proactively ask for feedback. But um, I think that goes back to the wonderful thing about our council table being so diverse is that if there's things that I'm missing, for the most part, there is a voice at that table that balances my perspective. And I always am mindful to be like respectful and listen. It doesn't mean that I'm going to agree or even change my mind. Sometimes I will, sometimes I won't, but I will always be respectful and listen to anyone who has anything to say. And I am, um, I think Lindsay, Councillor Koch sort of spoke to this too. I do not get a lot of active, you know, phone calls or um, emails or anything like that in my social circles people sort of bring things up loosely perhaps but I don't know if that's because I do so proactively put stuff out that people are able to sort of see where I'm at or if it's just because I'm so new to the community that maybe I don't have those long-standing relationships but I'm always willing to listen to other perspectives does not mean I'm going to always you know change my mind of where I'm at but I'm willing to always listen because that's the that's the great thing about it at this level is that I don't have to worry about my party voting with someone else's party. You you talk about the respect aspect of the job, and I, I want to pick up on that for a little bit, if that's OK, because um, you've probably over the last year had to make some pretty tough choices. And I'm assuming and I hate to assume, but I'm going to assume that you're going through a budget season right now that is going to be very tricky. Because there's an affordability crisis across this country right now, and the municipalities are on the front lines of it. You make a decision, it impacts your residents the day after you make it. And this could mean that people's service levels or uh, property taxes are going to increase or potentially stay the same. And that means service levels are not going to be increased or they're going to stay the same. How do you ensure, especially at the local level, that you respectfully talk to people because you're right. Some people may not want to talk to you. Some people may not want to engage, but with a 53.5% voter turnout, I am assuming that Kenora is engaged. They want to have a voice at the council table. How do you respectively engage with people without it turning into that nasty, he said, she said, name calling, and just make sure that people do feel like they're being heard, even if you don't agree with them? Yes. Yeah, so I... I don't personally like get into comments or anything like that on social media. I do always. But will offer people stop up. you in the grocery store? <laughs> Honestly, so I don't know if this is just. I have a very like basic stature. No one recognizes me. <laughs> no one does. I'm like at middling height, middling hair, mid, everything sort of middling. So no one recognizes me. So every all, counselor who's listening like, to this right now hates you with a passion. They're like, <laughs> God dang it, counselor. I wish I could do that. <laughs> it's like truly a superpower, I feel like. So, I mean, obviously people that I know um, and the people I know will be like, how is counsel? And depending on my relationship that we have, the conversation that we have, but um, going back to like how to sorry now i'm forgetting how do you, how do you respectfully first. have conversations with people yes where they just disagree with you vehemently because you, you were saying that you don't engage on social media with the negative comments yeah. so but i'm very you don't want to you don't want to just not no. respond to them because you don't no. want to feel like they're not being heard and they're they're just going to go away and not feel like they're being represented by you for sure. So I, I, so I do start with setting like very clear boundaries around it. Um, Cause I think that boundaries are just an important part of life and being able to um, 
have effective communication. Um, and so, so that's sort of where I start with it. I have like a little blurb on my social media of like, like these are sort of the rules of engagement with it. And that does not mean that I'm not, I have had lots of people tell me that they don't agree with the decisions that we've made. But for me, my, it's it's trying to make sure that we're having those conversations before the decisions made. So right now we are in um, budget discussions and we have a net tax levy number that's being like utilized as to where we're at. We are very much still in the discussion phase. So for me, what I'm trying to focus on with these convers- conversations is like, these are the decision points we have in this. And I share that all actively. And it's actually really interesting. The, pe- the feedback, that, feedback that I get back is, oh, wow, like I can see the argument for and against that. I can see why that this is a, like that's the feedback that I'm getting for the most part. Um, And and then we get to the part of like, there is going to be impacts at the end, but I try and make my decision based on, there's always sort of this thing in the back of my head because, so I'm 34, we amalgamated, Kenora used to be three separate municipalities. We amalgamated in 2000 and there's still stuff from that amalgamation that is just sort of flapping in the wind um, that needs to be, that have need to be addressed for, you know, decades at this point. And I, again, like that financial advisor piece of me is like, you pay now or you pay later and you always pay more later. And so I sort of have that feeling in my head. And I think maybe because I'm a parent to two little kids too, is like, and I'm a millennial. So I'm like the first generation who has not progressed beyond where their parents' generation was, is that I don't want to continue that trend for my kids. So while I am like very aware of the, the, like where we are at, it's also that balance of making sure that we're not further degradating like our existing assets. And I also think that we do have opportunities to be more creative in our um, revenue sources. And so I think that I think just focusing on that number just misses the point. It's an easy headline. But this is a way bigger and and also just a budget. It's like people think that a budget is set in stone, like a budget is your best guess, your best estimate of what's going to happen over the next year. And then a myriad of things can happen, there can be a global pandemic. Um, And you do the best you can to sort of work within that. So it's, it's, it's a way more complex um, and so I try and I try my best to make sure that I'm I'm making all of that information digestible for everyone and and I set boundaries. That's sort of where I come at it with is that if we're gonna get into like a screaming match, we'll walk away and we can do this again another time kind of thing. Um, we, we're sl- slowly getting into the issues uh, uh, part of the, the conversation here, and I before we do go into that full tilt, I want to preface this conversation by saying this is a conversation between the councillor and myself. This is not a motion of council. This is not a policy of council. This is not a direction of council. This is a conversation and the opinions of the councillor and the, talking to the host of the cross border interviews. So. With that being said, I'm going to ask you the same question I asked uh, Councillor Koch, and I'm going to ask you, and then ho- you might have the same answer, you may not, because you're two different people, but what do you see as the biggest issue or issues facing the city today as of recording this episode? So, Councillor Koch and I are different people, although I'm always very honoured to be mistaken for her, because she's a wonderful person. <laughs> but And so everything she said, I do completely agree with. For me personally, at the municipal level, I actually think one of our biggest issues is our official plan. It is very, I know that this is like not sexy answer or whatever. And this is for probably me not it the, is. For me, this, know, is, this but... is the best thing ever. <laughs> like, I'm excited for this conversation now. <laughs> it's one of those things that I don't think at the resident level, that would be the answer you get. But I personally find we have an extremely restrictive official plan for we have a lot very large geographic area in Kenora we have so we have like building height maximums that are like three stories you have to have like six million parking spots per unit and all of this stuff that has made it incredibly difficult to build and grow and make sure that we don't have to continue to reassess people for for years and that has been I mean there's nimbyism in that there's a myriad of different things there's the 
you know, amalgamation piece of being those three separate communities at, at one point. Um, and but can you still say that though? And, and I'm not trying to interrupt and I apologize for doing this, but no. you are not three communities anymore. While people may assume that you as a counselor, know you are not, you are one. And you have to make the best decision for everyone, not just this community or that community, or this community. It's what's best for the city. While people may assume that they're still part of another community, you know, you're one city. How do you make sure that that follows through on the decisions makings and the interactions with the residents when they're saying, well, it's not helping my community? Well, no, it is because you're the city of Kenora. You're not your community. Yeah. So, I mean, for me personally, because I'm not a local, I don't feel that, but it is incredible. The conversations that you have that you realize how much that is baked into the culture of Kenora. Um, like Kiwaitan is its own separate beast. There's the north of the bypass, which is its own separate beast. And um, uh, yeah, like I don't obviously look at it that way, but you can tell that there are community residents who do think of it in that very um granular way and it's ha it's for me the way that I always speak about it is that if you make a community work for everybody like if it works for someone who has the highest needs everyone thrives in it it's sort of just setting that base level of like if this works for everyone it works for everyone and and if everyone is thriving we all do better and there's no zero sum game when it comes to our ability to grow. So that's the way that I look at it. And there's always going to be, you know, you can't change everyone's minds and hearts all the time on everything. Whoa, and that's whoa, fine. whoa, breaking news here. You can't <laughs> change people's minds. Well, the great thing about me is like, I have my kids are, so my daughter just turned three and my son just turned three. Like people are yelling at me all of the time. My kids are constantly throwing tantrums. So if you want to be upset with me, I'm like, okay, well, get in line. Like, uh, okay. <laughs> like, well, welcome to my world. So I, I'm, to... I'm very aware that I'm not going to please everyone with my decisions, but my, my intention and my goal is always that if you make it work for everyone, it just works for everyone. It sounds so silly. You, you talk about the uh, official plan, uh, and that's one of the issues that you see as a big priority uh, for the city. I, I, I got to ask, because an official plan comes in many different sizes and forms, and you make it the best, and it's an ever-evolving plan. It's not something that mm -hmm. just sits on a shelf. It's something that you're constantly looking at and updating because things change. How do you ensure, because you talk about the nimbyism, and I, I want to pick up on that for a little bit. How do you ensure the people who have been there their entire life in the city of Kenora feel like it's the same community that they were born, raised, and still have a family in compared to people mm -hmm. who are just moving there and don't feel like it's uh, what they want it to be and they want to see growth, they want to see changes, they want to see zoning updates so that way it allows duplexes on a single uh, uh, lot how do you mm -hmm. balance the sort of old guard the nimbyism or do you just say mm -hmm. unfortunately we have to grow and things are going to have to change so i mean the easiest way to have that conversation is if we talk about the reassessment so if if someone is going to be fired up about the fact that we're going to have to, we're going to have to reassess values the only real other opportunity to like meaningfully uh reduce that is by growing and by adding new assessment and so it's for me I always go back to like the financial argument of it though is that I understand that feeling but everything grows and changes Kenora has grown and changed and, and so you know it's it's a mindset piece of like yeah for me it's it's just getting back to that that financial argument of if we if you want to not see whatever percentage tax increases, then we need to make sure that we're attracting people. And the thing is, so we're in Northwestern Ontario, we're on the Canadian Shield, we are, we are on Lake of the Woods, all of these things are beautiful and wonderful. From a building perspective, incredibly expensive. So we already have sort of that piece that can be a deterrent to developers. If you add in an official plan that's restrictive, if you add in a community that's not on board, 
you're going to be where we're at 30 years later, where we're building our first seniors home in 30 years. And we have an aging population. Wow. <laughs> I know your face right now is my, my feeling. And I, so, I, I, I'm sorry, but <laughs> your first seniors home in 30 years, that's been built like a, like a, um, of seniors yes, lodge, right? Thing. Like six or yes. seven. Uh... Well, so it's a 58 unit build that you have to be fit. It's huge and it's wonderful. And it's incredible and all these things, but you know, getting to that place with it was a, I think it was, and that was definitely, that was last council and everyone involved with that was prior to us, but it would have been an uphill battle getting there. Now, so it's not I, like there's I, not the need. I'm very cautious of time here and we're almost at the 30 minute mark and I have been accused on this show in the last month or so of only talking about the negative things about communities. And when we talk about communities, I only ask about the issues. I never ask about the accomplishments, but I've been changing that in the month of November. And I want to pose this question to you. What do you brag about? For the city of Kenora. When you go to AMO, when you go to conferences, when you speak with other municipal leaders from across Ontario, what's the thing that you say, you might be doing it right, Kenora's doing it better? <laughs> so, <laughs> well, so I, I actually think I have this really cool perspective of being a non-local to have this conversation. Like I made an active adult decision to make Kenora my home where, I, you know, I grew up in BC. I've lived in Southern Ontario. I've lived in Manitoba. I've had my little tastes of places all across Canada. And Canada is such a incredible, you know, geographic masterpiece across um, everywhere. So I think Kenora, we have like a, it's, it's got this, you're in nature everywhere you go you're in nature like I look at my my backyard and I have city hall in my backyard and then I have the beautiful harbor front is my backyard like it's incredible here but it's also geographically I mean we are sort of big enough we have every amenity that you need as far as like shopping or we're two hours from an international airport that's going to get you anywhere so we have we're like so we're two hours from Winnipeg, which is oh. a weird way of describing. I know. <laughs> I was like, "Wait, Toronto's not Where? two hours," and, and it shouldn't. It shouldn't. It shouldn't shock me because literally, I drove from Kenora to Winnipeg yeah. in yeah. August, so I should know that. <laughs> but for some reason, when you stop at every community along the way, it takes longer than two hours. <laughs> so we have that. You can like you can truly live like rural and remote here. Um, and get that whole sense. But then I like I live I'm I'm more of a downtown kind of girl and I live downtown and I can walk to work to city council. I can walk to the library with my kids. And we also have um incredible, incredible city facilities. Like our pool at our rec center is a game changer. Um we have our discovery center, which does um, a partnership with Science North, which is so cool. Our library is incredible. We have a museum and art center, which are like world class, in my opinion. So we have all of these incredible city facilities and community facilities. And there is really just like, it's like the best of both wor worlds, in my opinion. You're rural, but not really remote, I guess. Um, I... I... You, you talk about the nature aspect of your community and Lynn's, uh, Councillor Koch and I also talked about the nature aspect of it as well, but I want to pick up on a little bit this year. You have an, a massive backyard, basically, and I say you as in the Royal U.S. City of Kenora. This means that you have to work in collaboration with a lot of your surrounding municipalities because I'm assuming they're coming in, they're staying in Kenora, then they might be going outside of Kenora to do all their tourism things. So for you, what do you, when people come to Kenora, what do you tell them to do? Like, what, what, what is the tourist draw to Kenora? Because <laughs> I'm coming back through. I did not get the full experience of Kenora when I was there. But when I come back through, what are the things from your perspective that I should be doing or other tourists should be doing? So, like, as I mentioned I am a parent so from a kid's perspective we recently have a rotary splash park which we have done also in this last year we've had a lot of money invested in the park that's surrounding it to make it fully accessible 
too. And there is the Hoopla Island, which is one of those big like inflatable. So that whole area um, at Norman Park and there's Dairy Queen there too. So like win, 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 win. So that if you have family, kids, that is just a gemstone. I also am just such a huge fan of Mosswood Adventures. She's a new um, business owner. She started last year and in the winter, she has ice bikes that you can go ride bikes on the ice roads. I know, isn't that incredible? And then in the summer, she started this year where you can rent water bikes, um, paddle boards, uh, some canoes and that out at uh, Rabbit Lake. So I, that's just like a really, she her focus is like accessible water access because we obviously have like a lot of boating and, and those kind of things, but not everyone has the means and ability in order to access the lake through those ways. So she has created these really cool ways to access the lake for everyone. And then I do always want love highlighting. I know I said it before, but like our discovery centers is an incredible building and just like if you need to go and take a really great selfie or like a view, a photo, the views, it's right on like the woods. It's incredible. And, and you have to check out our museum and, and art center. You've sold me because I, I'm a massive <laughs> fan of museums. So and I go will downtown, be... go up downtown. It's I love walking downtown hey, and shopping and toodling around. <laughs> I did at two o'clock in the morning and it was the best experience of my <laughs> Life, uh, which by the sounds of it, I probably walked by your house and not even know it because you're right around the Pretty corner close. from City Hall. Yeah. Um, <laughs> the, it seems like, and I'm just from that last statement you said there, it seems like there's a lot of ingenuity going on in your community. There's a lot of people saying, what doesn't the community have? How can I fill that void? You talk about the water bikes, you talk about the accessibility aspect of it. Is that what makes Kenora such a great place to live and work and raise a family? Oh, absolutely. I think that that's a little bit like of a Northern thing too. You know, like we are Northern, especially Northwestern Ontario is its own beast when it comes to Ontario. And I think we know that too a bit. Like when you go to um, the Northern Ontario Municipal Association meetings, there is just a, you know, we know that we're not going to be the priority at anyone's table at Queen's Park or anything like that. And not to discount, you know, we have our, our representatives from the province and federal uh, governments or anything, but just en masse, we know that Toronto is the center of the world. Um and so whoa, whoa, we know whoa. That you're we... telling that to an Albertan? <laughs> I, I don't understand this. Toronto doesn't get its way all the time. What? <laughs> <laughs> so I think we know how to make work and for like and I love that about that because for me I'm like I would always rather I'm like if I can do something I'm gonna do like if I can do that thing for a person like I'm gonna do it if I can whatever accomplish this thing like by all means pat me on the shoulder so so I think that's such a wonderful thing about our community is they are so good at getting it done what else makes your community such a great place to live, work, and raise a family? Because you get uh, things done anywhere. But for you, mm -hmm. what do you tell people about Kenora that people say, you know what, that's a wonderful place? We, we've talked a lot about the outdoors aspect. We've talked about the community aspect. But there's a sense when I, when I drove through Kenora and I was at a few restaurants because I was picking up my morning breakfast at four o'clock in the morning to get on the road, to try and make it back to Calgary before sunset, which I did not <laughs> to my husband's chagrin. <laughs> I've done that. I've done that drive. Cause Kimberly's just, you know, four <laughs> hours past. So that was our summer road trip. <laughs> I got a sense that your community is engaged. Your I got a sense that your community is aware of what's going on in the community because when I was asking people, they were willing to give up their uh, time and talk to me. Why does it? Why is Kenora so good? Because I, I've, I've spent numerous time, numerous days on the road in the last few months, and I can tell you, Kenora, there was a, there was an aura of friendliness, happiness, and just downright just helpfulness. What? Why is that? Oh, that just makes my heart sing. It's just, it is, it's just a great community. I don't even know if I, like, I maybe have to get someone to come and do a research study. Cause I don't know if I could get you to the, what it is, but I think it is because there is that small town heart within everyone. And 
Um, well, we are changing and growing. And obviously, I am such an advocate of that, because you get those things that, you know, that add a perspective of, of like, hey, why don't you do it this way? Similar to Moss Foot Adventures coming in and be like, hey, you know, why don't we do ice bikes? No one else had thought of that before. So, so I, I, you need I to bring that... someone in there, counselor. You do need to truly bring <laughs> someone in. Um, but for me personally, I'm like, I, you know, so we have little kids. My, my husband, it takes him like four minutes to get to work. It takes me two. There's just this quality of life of small town feeling, but still having that access to so many things that are not, you know, some, some more rural and remote areas do not have access to all those things that I listed before. So we get to have that huge quality of life of not being stuck on a train for 30 minutes to an hour, but we still have all of these wonderful facilities and we're so close and able to be able to access like literally anything that you need. Counselor, I have taken about 35 minutes, well, almost 40 minutes of your time. And I want to say this. Thank you. Thank you so much for sitting down with me today and having this honest to goodness conversation. I, I find in today's society, we don't do this enough, but I, I'm finding uh, as I sit down with more municipal leaders from across Canada, that I am learning the art of the conversation is back and municipal mm. leaders want to have those conversations. So thank you for serving your community. Thank you for being part of your community and thank you for being part of the show. It's, it's always great to chat with municipal leaders from across Canada and I have learned so much about yourself in the last 40 minutes that I, I'm i looking forward now to coming back to Kenora and visiting yourself and Councillor Koch. Uh, Yay. And maybe getting a better tour than just the nighttime, yeah. two o'clock in the morning walk downtown. <laughs> yes, please let us know when we're coming back. We'll do a full tour for sure. And thank you so much for this opportunity, Chris. This was really wonderful. Thank you for joining us for another great episode of Cross Border Interviews. Your continued interest in delving deep into the issues that shape communities from across Canada is both inspiring and essential to our show. As we wrap up, it is my hope that you've gained valuable insights into the intricate world of municipal politics from our guest today. If you found this dialogue as engaging as I did, don't forget to hit that subscribe button today. By subscribing, you're not just staying up to date on the latest conversations, but you're also playing a vital role in supporting our endeavor to bring you more meaningful content like you saw today. We couldn't embark on this journey without your support. Creating content that sheds light on the issues affecting municipalities requires dedication and resources. Now, if you believe in our mission and want to help us to continue to grow, please consider visiting our support page conveniently linked in the show notes below. Every contribution, big or small, goes a long way in ensuring that we can continue to deliver the kind of content that you've come to expect from us. Once again, thank you for being part of the cross-border interviews community. Your engagement is what fuels our passion for shedding light on the issues that truly matter. Until next time, stay informed, stay engaged, and most importantly, just keep talking.